Welcome everybody to this month's Opswot Academy webinar. I'm Nate Medeiros, the product owner of Opswot Academy, and I am thrilled to have here today George. Uh, George, can you introduce yourself and uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? I surely can, Nate. Thank you for having me. My name is George. Uh, I work as a sales engineering manager at Opswot. And how long have you been here? I've been with Opswot six years. All right, so you, you've seen you've seen some customer environments, you've seen some things. I'm I'm really excited to uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the use cases and some of the uh, the ideas and concepts that it pertains to our subject today of data at rest. Um, so the for everybody in the webinar, the concept today that we want to discuss is uh, the idea of files and folders residing already within your organization. Um, it's a pretty often overlooked area of cybersecurity because we often think if we have a secure perimeter around our infrastructure, then once the data is there, it's safe. Uh, but that's really not the case. And and George, you want to maybe start talking a little bit as to, you know, why we still need to, um, you know, worry about and, and have secure practices for data that's already been scanned as it made its way into our network? Yeah, 100%. Like, like you said in the introduction, uh, most customers just focus on securing the data as the data comes into the network and then you know they check the box and then they think it, it's all good, they're safe. Uh, when actually the data is in the network, right? It can be there for um, a, a lot longer, it can be there for years, depending on the customers. Um, policies that they need to, to be compliant with. And they obviously have to have a mechanism that continuously analyzes that data for malware, especially in the light of uh, you know, more targeted attacks, especially aiming towards critical infrastructure. Um, so definitely there has to be a process on how data is handled once it's been, been imported into the network. And we're not talking only about archiving and um, you know things, things that are already implemented, uh, but we're, we're talking here about malware protection uh, against that, those files. And we shouldn't only rely on things like endpoint protection. But, but why though? Like what's the, what's the reasoning to say, if I have a, a strong border protection uh, and then I have a file that I put in my network and I open it two years later, uh, why, why would I need to worry about it two years later if I already scanned it? That's a good point. <clears throat> so, we probably all know and can acknowledge there's nothing like 100% detection. Um, and the reason we see that many zero days and breaches out there, it's because there's no solution that can fix all the security uh, challenges a customer has. That being said, scanning the file today doesn't mean the file is going to be clean for the entire lifetime of that file in the network. Um, and you know, like back to my point with targeted attacks and very, very sophisticated attacks, those can evade uh, the perimeter and all the security controls that might have been implemented in the perimeter already. Um, let's take the, the example of a zero day, right? It's called a zero day because it can't be detected in day zero. Um, but if you just scan it or analyze it with different technologies when it's being imported, and they all say it's it's safe, right? They, you get green check mark. Um, then you're going to assume that file is going to be safe for maybe a year um, in in your network. Or just it, at that point, not, of, at that point in time, right? Like at that at moment, that point in time. Yeah, at that moment, exactly. this file is good to me. So it's not exactly. like the file's changing. It's just the detection mechanisms at that point in time said everything was good. Correct. Yeah, and th there's multiple factors that um, somehow work towards that result. Um, but because we, you know, more and more companies and we as vendors try to um, um, change to the mindset and, uh, and, and, you know, customers do that uh, as well with the assume breach policy. Um, obviously, that somehow aligns with what you have to do with the data after it's being imported and, and it's at rest in your network. And as a best practice, you should analyze it uh, regularly. 
uh, after it's been imported and it's at rest, uh, just to be, to be able to uncover a potential outbreak, right? That, that file changing, um, it's not the file that changes, it's the detection that, that evolves and improves over time. And that file might be picked up a couple of days, weeks, months, well, years. Well, let me, let me ask you about that. So, so what exactly is changing? If we're saying that a file's coming in and we're scanning it and all the checkboxes are green saying everything's good to go uh, and we're saying you should scan it again uh, if within your network um, because it might not be green when you scan it again, what, what exactly is changing on that second time around? Uh, there's a couple of things that will change throughout time. Uh, one is the detection capabilities uh, on the uh, detection technologies. Right? Here we're talking antivirus engines. Um, in different shapes and forms, right? That can be your EDR, your um, traditional endpoint solution, or it can be a solution that combines multiple of those AV engines. Um, those vendors, obviously, they improve their detection over time. They release new signatures, new <clears throat> algorithms to detect uh, advanced malware. Um, as those attacks surface, um, and obviously, the detection uh, of those solutions would improve and we need to leverage those improvements in the technology for the data at rest to be able to potentially discover threats that exist dormant in the network yeah i think that's a that's a really really important point there I, i'd like to talk about that a little bit more you mentioned two um really critical aspects with with the av vendors is one one's those definitions and the other one is the detection algorithms you know how well those those are the real mean potatoes of what we're bringing to the table when we're saying that you should rescan these files because those things are changing uh you know here at opswat we don't create our own antivirus engines we utilize antivirus engines um in multiple ways if, through multiple form factors uh and and combine them so that we're you know we're scanning a single file against uh, five, ten, twenty engines. Uh, each of those companies, each of those vendors, uh, you know whether whether if it's McAfee or Avast or or any of them, they have their own process, right, to update to update their engine. So let, let's break this down into 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 two subjects because I don't want to lose track. Um, I first want to talk about the antivirus definitions, and then I want to talk a little bit about those detection algorithms and what what those look like as we as we talk about them colloquially. Um, so definitions. I mean, this is something that um, you know the the antivirus companies themselves are constantly updating, right? So, um, what's what's a really high level uh, uh, perspective as to, to what's actually happening there with the, with those antivirus definitions? Just from um, you know the actual vendor themselves, all the way getting to at some kind of endpoint detection tool. Yeah, those those AV vendors, they would release uh, so-called signature updates. It's essentially, um, in many cases, um, a, a pattern matching or some sort of heuristic algorithm that allows them to discover a known attack, a known piece of threat. Right, and they obviously do that on a daily basis. They might do it multiple times a day. They might do it several times a week. Each vendor has their own cadence uh, in, in terms of releasing those uh, signatures, right? those uh, definition updates. And that's really important too, to consider it is. Um, as, to, as to why you may not want to, um, if, if, if there is an uh, antivirus vendor that has a cadence of every other day, uh, that file that you scan, uh, that was zero day that they're working on updating their engines for, uh, that might, might might not be detected for two days because their sure. their cadence is you know not every day. Where maybe yeah. another vendor does do pushes every day, and you know they would see it. So that's another big reason why we're we're big uh, advocate for scanning against not just one, not having that single point of failure. It is exactly, and you know that that becomes a real problem when you're only using one AV vendor, like you said, right? And then we're trying to move away from that and use uh, the crowdsource intelligence of different AV vendors. And what we do is we also choose them in a, and package them in a way where we distribute them globally. 
What I mean with that is when we create the packages of our multi-scanning offering, we tend to choose vendors from different parts of the world in the same package. So our customers always have a geographical distribution of those uh, AV vendors and their uh, research uh, facilities. Uh, I usually tell customers a, a story, right? And that's a real life story. Um, it's the story of industri industrial, uh, sorry, Olympic destroyer. Um, it is a malware that was targeting the um, Olympic um, Games uh, in South Korea. I think it was in 2018, if I'm not wrong. Um, and that just happened after Russia was discovered, uh, or the Russian athletes was discovered doping, and they were banned from attending the games. Um, so it was the first edition of the Olympic Games without Russia Russia being present. Um, so what they did, they they retaliated, right? So what they what what they actually did, they created this piece of malware, which the now now the industry uh, knows as Olympic Destroyer. And they obviously targeted the infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. the IT infrastructure of the um, the company that organized the the Olympics. Um, the the company that provided the security services was a company called Anlab. Um, it's a vendor, a security vendor. They also have an endpoint product that's not very well known in Europe or the US. Um, so. Chances of customers using that product on their endpoint are really small in this part of the world, um, but they were the ones that um, are the are the ones that responded to the incident. They managed to release a signature update that was able to detect that uh, piece of threat. All right, and like like always happens, you can't really contain the malware uh, in a specific geolocation or a specific network. So that malware started spreading and affected customers in, in other parts of the world, in Europe and in, in, in the Americas. And because we leverage that AV vendor, uh, Anlab, we were able Anlab to, AV. exactly. Yeah. Anlab was part of the Opsat offering and we, we were able to leverage that new detection capability that was added into the product. The other vendors might have, and they probably caught up um, in the following days, but we we were able to provide that detection capability to customers, and that's that's where you know having a multiple well a multi AV strategy uh, really uh, it really shows its benefits. Really, right. uh, we have a, a question here from the audience. It's actually pretty relevant to your story that you just told. It's uh, how do AV vendors decide which definitions to upload to their databases? So you actually mentioned this when when you uh, talked about the research labs. Uh, so some some vendors do this in different ways. Uh, sometimes yeah. they have large automated sandboxes that are just constantly scanning uh, new threats that research teams gather. But but uh, you know oftentimes, especially for high profile, there's going to be you know boots on the ground, somebody that's actually trying to analyze in, right. in that um, in that as well. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, so George's story kind of covered that with uh, a really good use case of, you know, maybe a vendor that's not so well known uh, that their research team got that definition to their platform before all the other big players did. Um, and because that was part of our offering, you know, the, 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 the suite of AVs that we use in our scanning solutions was more effective than a, a big name player uh, like Norton or... Um, or McAfee uh, on its own. So that's that's kind of like a big part of our philosophy as to why we don't rely on just one vendor. So uh, that's that's a, I think that's a pretty good um, you know grasp as as to definitions as as to what they are. They're they're quick and easy signatures that we can reference just by looking at the uh, the the flat uh, information about the file and comparing that to a signature. Um, from the antivirus definition. Now you mentioned uh, also algorithms, and these are and these can change uh, with a, with different AB vendors with different approaches. One one of the, one of the biggest, uh, I think, the easiest ones to um, uh, to address here is the way that AV engines handle heuristics differently. Um, you know, when we talk about a heuristic. Heuristic does have a few different meanings in the in the world of um, malware analysis or malware scanning. Uh, 
here I'm we're we're, we're uh, explicitly using the term for the static analysis portion, um, not the heuristic dynamics. And what I mean by that is we're looking at typically segments of compiled code of whatever the file is, and that's going to um, uh, change depending on how the AV vendors decide what to look at and what to do with those uh, different portions of those files. So, um, you know, you can almost think of it as, as, as windowing a magnifying glass, because if I say this little bit of code is going to flag a file as malware, well, the smaller I get, the more, op the more likely I'm going to see that um, with all kinds of files. And then we see false positives all the time. And then that's not a very effective solution. If I can't trust my AV vendor to tell me that that's really malware, uh, if it's overly suspicious, um, or at the same time, if I'm too broad, then I might miss something because the, you know, the hacker changes just a little bit of the code. Uh, and now it's no longer matching my heuristic pattern matching. And now I'm, I'm, it, it's not any better than just the regular static. So they're constantly adjusting these, uh, these pattern ma matching uh, recognition of of the heuristic engines as well, and those those algorithms that they that they use to identify and weight and classify um, uh, files as malware, even if it doesn't directly match a signature, you know that's what we're talking about when we're, we're saying heuristic static analysis, and that's what George, the other half of that, um, the other half of that coin that George mentioned is, you know, those are constantly getting updated as well because they're constantly tweaking the effectiveness of those of those algorithms and of those search patterns um, so that in itself i you know we've talked almost 15 minutes just about those two little elements about data at rest um, it, it's such an important aspect to it so so let's 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 back up a little bit more uh, and, and look at the, the the general big picture that we're talking about today so we have we have a file that is um, within our network. And we know that if I scan this thing in two weeks from now, or even even you know four days later, I might not have the same uh, result that we um, that I had when I first originally scanned that file. So just taking OpSWAT out of the, you know, out of the general um, conversation for now, ju just as a conceptual, um, idea from from an IT administrator. What what do I need to do uh, in order to set up a process that's actually going to be able to protect myself and my organization from this kind of scenario that we find ourselves in? Yeah. So the, the easiest way to do it is implement a schedule scan or some sort of regular scan of the data set of the data that's at rest. That can be done through your endpoint solution. Uh, obviously, we've discussed why the, that might not be sufficient, but it's a good starting point, right? Um, and you also have to consider what happens when you, when your AV or when your detection technology manages to to detect uh, something as malicious, it has to be part of a bigger process. And obviously, integration and automation it's it's really essential in this in this case. Um, ideally, those logs should be sent to the uh, uh, SOC team, and the SOC team should be able to act on it and potentially start an incident response uh, based on that type of data that's provided by the detection technology. But the first and the most essential first step is implement that uh, regular scanning. Um, and then the interval, you know, it, it would be determined based on ideally how often the uh, anti antivirus engines get new detection capabilities, right? It can be every two days, it can be uh, uh, maybe once a week. It also depends on how big the data set is. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things that you have to consider, but um, the, the bottom line is start implementing a mechanism where you Rescan regularly the data set. Now, if we if we consider it, uh, the data itself is already residing somewhere. Um, you know, and, and a lot of use cases might not be directly needed by the end user at that time. Um, 
Is this would is this a uh, a good opportunity to use something like sandboxing or file emulation to get you know detonation events? Is this some, is this a good place for us to work that in? Because uh, one of the biggest challenges with sandboxing is finding a, a you know an appropriate location uh, it, at the life cycle of some kind of data yeah. flow. So maybe hey, can you talk a little bit about that. Hundred percent, and you bring you bring a really good point here. Um, now. Storage vendors have different mechanisms of allowing you to implement that continuous analysis of files. Um, obviously, they allow you to schedule scans, but you can also uh, implement a scan um, at the moment when someone accesses the file, and that's where you can't use a sandbox because users would have to, to wait for the analysis. But you bring a good point in trying to fold the sandbox analysis into the picture when the files are not being uh, being used. So the end users don't really have, there's no impact on the end user and the responsiveness of that file. And because sandbox is um, a more expensive process in terms of resources and time, it should be used when there's no time constraints uh, for the users. Um, ideally, it can be done overnight. Um, and obviously sandbox thing, uh, like I said, Takes, takes longer than AV detection and AV scanning. Um, and we probably want to maybe look at the, the very big data set and somehow split it in smaller chunks. So we can do this every night. And literally you'll have a worker uh, pushing files through the sandbox every single night. And then once you do that, you start from the beginning uh, and you can implement the same with uh, with the AV, uh, AV engines uh, as well. Right, and by worker you mean automated process to go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so not, yeah. not not somebody staying up late at night, uh, uploading one one file at a time. Preferably. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that's that's a that's a really good point too, because this this approach, the sandboxing approach or the file emulation approach, where we're actually detonating the malware, that doesn't have the same limitations when we're when we talk about those algorithms and we talk about those uh, signatures. It doesn't rely on either of those things. Uh, it's able to uh, detect, uh, you know, detonate and detect for itself um, whether or not the file is showing malicious behavior. Uh, you know, and we, we have new approaches to uh, malware itself has gotten more um, advanced over the years where it can detect that it's in a virtual machine and, so, and not run its payload and, and then therefore not get detected by a particular sandbox. Um, but to combat that, we have, you know, new, new solutions such as file emulation in a sandbox, which uh, will, you know, still run through the different stages of the file and execute, um, you know, its behavior regardless, uh, regardless if it detects if it's in a virtual machine or not, because it's still going through those different stateless or those different stages um, of the file execution. So we're, we're able to get more information that way. And that bypasses that, um, those advancements of, of the malware sandbox detection. So, but, but either way, there's still, like you said, that, the responsiveness issue. So we either have the the AVs that are there to do the scan so quickly that it does we don't even notice it, um, or we have some kind of detonation mechanism, but that doesn't fit well with the user experience. If I need my file now, I don't want to wait, especially for traditional sandbox. I don't want to wait, you know, minute and a half or two minutes for that, yeah, um, for that thing to 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 actually get to me. So. Yeah, if we can somehow find a way to incorporate that uh, with data that's already within our network, just sitting there within storage, and maybe run through those, you know, period like as a as a waterfall down through our internal storage network, and then re, you know cycle back. That's an ideal scenario because you're getting both. Um, and then, like you mentioned before, having some kind of centralized place to get notifications, whether it's an AV scan or for, uh, or with a, a sandbox type scan, um, a dynamic scan um, that, you know, these are, these are getting found, but, but I mean, ultimately that's a very difficult um, infrastructure to establish, to set up, uh, you know, all those moving pieces. Right? It is hundred percent. And uh, to 
probably something we need to also make it clear here on on the sandbox. There's there's going to be limitations no matter what sandboxing technologies you're you're going to use. Um, not all file types will be supported. There's usually file size limits, and you can't solely rely on sandboxing for that. So it ha the, the strategy should include different technologies that can complement each other for files that can't be analyzed by one. Um, so you have to have a layered approach, right? A, a defense in depth approach when it comes to protecting the data at rest. Right, which is a concept that we've, I think we've brought up on almost every uh, every interview that I've had so far. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a motif that we have within the uh, cybersecurity in industry, but um, it's also almost like a fractal where you have a general layered approach, but then you look at one of those layers and if you really look at it, there's layers within the layers. Yeah, uh, you know, we <laughs> data data at rest. You consider another as one of your layers of overall security, but you look at how you approach that, and there's there's stages to that as well. I mean, it's there, there's a reason why you know we, especially when we're talking about uh, infrastructure and those critical environments, you know, um, even in the official terminology, um, you know, the, the practice is malware mitigation. It's not malware elimination because correct. You can't you can't reliably say that with anything. Uh, you know, there's <laughs> there's always going to be some new threat vector that is going to be exploited or that nobody knows about yet that's waiting around the corner. So, what can we do to you know to absolutely mitigate um, you know those those scenarios? So that's and, really the, oh, go ahead. And and to your point, I I do consider cybersecurity is not about eliminating threats is it's it's all about making a breach as difficult as possible and deterring the uh, attackers um because you can't provide 100 security right that's it can't be done even through a defense in depth strategy there's still going to be pieces of malware that can get through um but if you make it as difficult as possible um, they're going to be uh, uh, put off in, in terms of attacking your specific organization. Right. Or just be limited as to what they can actually do once they once the breach does. Correct. Happen. Yeah. That's why we have other, um, you know, general best practices as well with network layering, segmentation, um, you know, the multiple stages of analysis. You know, we, we mentioned that we're talking now about the data that's residing uh, within non-volatile memory within our network. Um, but then there's other mechanisms we're using to, um, you know, scan for malware that might be running on the volatile memory of your PC or going through your perimeter or uh, being sent via email. There, there's so many different things that we can do uh, to uh, make sure the, the entire data workflow ecosystem within an organization at least has uh, some kind of mechanism that's protecting those elements. And uh, you know, when you culminate all those things together, the probability of, um, you know, uh, of any kind of breach doing significant damage goes way down. And that's the, the general philosophy with what we try to solve. Um, so going, going back to the data at rest, you know, I, I'm I'm actually really excited to have you on this call because um, you know you've been with OpSwap for uh, six years, and I'm sure you've seen some really interesting use cases that might paint a picture as to you know the problem that we're talking about and the problem that we're trying to solve here. And I know you can't bring in uh, any specific customer names, so we're we're gonna we're gonna leave that out of the request here. Um, but do you have any uh, examples of um, you know one of our customers that was trying to address this particular kind of challenge um and then and, and you know what the general over solution was to to address it yeah 100 percent. i mean as customers from different industries um uh, when when we start talking we're some in many cases we're talking about protecting data and motion right in the perimeter uh, but then as the discussion evolves you know, we bring up this the subject, right? What happens with the data after it's being being stored, right? Yes, we can protect and we can analyze the data in motion. Um, and like you said, different different ways the data gets into the network. We have a solution for that. Um, but then we, we also have to look at this. And the good thing with OPSA technology is that customers can leverage uh, the system in protecting both data in motion and data at rest. Like with the same setup, 
during the day, they can analyze the data in motion. During the night, they can analyze the data at rest. It's just another integration point from our perspective. Um, and there's, there's also a part of education that we're doing with customers where we, like I said, the, the, the focus point is protecting against file-based threats that come into the network, right? And after we solve that for customers, we then look at ways to implement that continuous scanning mechanism for the data at rest. We can do that through different ways, uh, especially for finance customers. Uh, we do that by integrating to their storage and that can be on-premise storage and we can you know, do that uh, by leveraging our ICAP product. Uh, a lot of the uh, traditional storage vendors, on-premise storage vendors, I mean, they, they support ICAP as an interface, which allows us to offload that uh, file analysis to a dedicated system like Copsoc. Um, and through that the interface, we can schedule the scan on regular intervals. We can also enforce the scan uh, on access of, of that file. Um, but finance customers, if we're, we're discussing about that type of industry, they, they have a really mature cloud adoption and they shift from using on-premise storage to cloud object storage. And um, obviously when you move into the cloud, uh, there is a shared responsibility model that you have to be aware of. Um, yeah. the, the vendor provides you the infrastructure, but you're in charge of the security of your own data in that infrastructure. It's not gonna be the, vend the cloud vendor that, that gets breached. It's gonna be you as a business in the end. Um, well, and we've seen. Can, can, can so, I ask you a question about that? Yeah, uh, just, sure. Just, from, just from your experience with with the the cloud storage, um, if I'm somebody like uh, you know Google Drive or or Dropbox or or you know a, a cloud storage vendor, am I not going to have built-in mechanisms that's going to detect malicious files that I'm uploaded? Because when you say sec my own security for my files. I can accept that you know I might have my own credit card information on there, um, or um, you know other sensitive data that I could easily accidentally share with the wrong person, mm -hmm. and that's entirely my fault. Um, but shouldn't these large cloud solutions have uh, like anti malware um, solution scanning properties already in place with them, or is that typically something you don't see? Some vendors do provide that out of the box. Like if we're talking OneDrive, there is some sort of um, uh, antivirus detection that's part of the license. Most of the cloud object ven uh, storage vendors, they don't provide anything. Um, so, so they don't care. They don't care if we're uploading malicious files to their... their correct. Their... I mean, it's, it's your responsibility to secure that infrastructure in the end, right? It's your infrastructure. It just runs in the cloud in the end, right? Mm. Uh, they do provide you the means to secure it. They usually have marketplaces where you can um, integrate different kinds of solutions uh, into the, the storage, uh, the, cloud, uh, the cloud object storage to scan those files, but it's the customer's responsibility to do that. And we've seen so many examples where threat actors use unsecure S3 buckets to host right. the malware um, or use it as, a, as, a, as an infrastructure to spread the malware or, or as, a, as a control infrastructure for the, the malware operation. Right. And that's simply because there's no built-in security out of the box right? uh, in, in many of those. And I suppose there kind of has to be you know, if you if you think about it as well, because how frustrating would it be to be using Amazon S3 for my development project and I'm uploading, you know, segments of my code or, or some certain files uh, to my project and, uh, you know, the S3 built in anti malware feature blocks my files and all of a sudden I don't know mm -hmm. what's not working and where. So. I guess there is, you know, there there definitely are some valid reasons why you don't want, you really want to avoid false positives um, with with a you know cloud storage solution. Perhaps the best uh, the best approach that they've come up with really is to put, take their hands off the wheel and say, yeah. you know, that's your responsibility as as an end user. And it, I I do understand this, right? Because in the end, it's the customer that wants to decide what technologies they choose to protect their own business. 
um, and the the vendors, the, the big cloud vendors, just leave it up to the customer uh, to decide what goes in there. Um, but again, right, it has to be secured one way or another. And, right. and uh, don't want to repeat this, but it is the customer's responsibility to do that, and they they should should be doing it. Right. Right. Okay. So this is something that you've seen a lot with uh, you, a heavy adoption with the finance industry. And yeah. And is this posing more of a challenge dealing with uh, cloud vendors versus on-prem? Is it, uh, or is it this, uh, you know, the same, uh, same approach, different environment kind of situation? I, I wouldn't say it's a challenge um, for us, especially at Opsot. Um we have products that natively integrate into all those popular cloud object storage vendors. Um, so from, from an integration perspective, it's actually quite simple. Uh, it's just, just finding the right integration point and building a process after that. Uh, the good thing with uh, the native integrations that we provide is that it just works on the back end. Uh, there's no difference in the end user experience. The users still upload their files to their S3 buckets, OneDrive accounts. Um, and, and so on. And we do the analysis uh, behind the scenes and we can automate some actions based on those results of the analysis. So should the file be malicious, we can move it to a quarantine location, we can delete it and so on and so forth. Um, right. I would say uh, maybe it becomes a bit more um, challenging when we do this type of implementation in critical infrastructure customers because there, you know, there's a lot more. Um, you have to be uh, to be a lot more careful with what you do with the data. Sometimes, even if the data is malicious, you might not want to delete it uh, because it can hold some some of the processes that exist there. And in many well, cases, we forensics. just want to flag this. And forensics, of course. Yeah. In many cases, we just want to flag it, and um, then the customer will decide based on that file and that process what's going to, going to happen with that specific thread. They might yeah, just I'm, choose to contain it and leave it there. That's 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 so that's so that's a huge game changer. That's so important because if we are now talking about critical infrastructure facilities, um, or, or even even any critical system that's using cloud storage uh, in any sense, you know, unless it's, I guess, in, unless at, at the absolute minimum, you're talking about, you know, a three stage backup and that's just one of the stages, mm -hmm. you know, outside of that, that particular use case, um, you know, you're changing your entire traditional perimeter workflow. And those, those traditional network perimeters, are, are really where we still see, you know, in critical infrastructure, that's where we see it the most. Uh, you know, a lot of enterprise companies, corporations, huge shift to uh, cloud infrastructure. You know, even Active Directory services are now moving to Azure. Yeah. Some people are, uh, you know, getting off of that particular type of user management entirely. Um, you know, there's no, you rarely see localized uh, file servers within uh, buildings anymore. Now you're using uh, cloud services, especially with work from home environments, you know, that, that even, even that uh, initial, um, you know, picture that we drew at the beginning of this call, when we talked about scanning a file at that point of entry, and then now it's in our storage, you know, that type of, um, you know, use case isn't even there for a lot of these scenarios with companies that are using storage as the, as cloud storage as their primary mechanisms of sharing files. Yeah. So now, now that data at rest is your, that is your point. That is the, the, the place where, you know, the first touch happens um, with, you know, the, the analysis. And um, that's a, a hugely important point, I think, to, to, you know, to, to bring up here that, um, the the overall shift between the traditional network perimeter and how we handle data passing in and where it's stored, uh, you know, is not cut and dry. It's there's all kinds of different use cases for it, and this is a this is a really big one. Yeah, and, and I've seen this week and last week I've been working with a customer in the manufacturing space, automotive to be more specific, um, and they slowly open up to 
uh, to using cloud services. And what we're doing is we're securing the, their data at rest from the uh, uh, their, their file servers and SMB shares and migrating that into, into the cloud, right? And again, securing data at rest becomes even more important here when you move your data into the cloud, right? You want, you start fresh, you build a new infrastructure. You don't want to be transferring malware that might have existed in the in the on-premise infrastructure into your new cloud infrastructure. Um, how can you do that? Well, you need to analyze uh, that on-premise data before you migrate it. And we facilitate that with uh, with our Meta Defender for Secure Storage product where we can you know, implement that continuous rescan um, and then the migration itself um, through just one product. Well, there we go. So that's uh, that's one particular use case because the the general use case of of uh, Metafender for secure storage is to have that periodic rescan for yeah. my existing cloud solutions. So is this just a, a customer where um, they are currently in the process of migrating all of their all of their files and we're setting up that rescan there or scanning the files on the way? So we're scanning the files on their on premise storage for a while now and Got slowly it. migrating some of that data into their cloud. And that's going to be a process that, that will go on for a couple of months uh, from now. It's obviously they're going to run hybrid for uh, probably a couple of years. Um, they can't get rid of all the on-premise infrastructure as you, you might expect. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is we do that for the on-premise, we do that for the cloud, right? Same strategy has to apply because it's, it's the same data at rest. It just resides in a different place, but it's still internal users accessing that data. Um, and if the file is, is malicious, the company can get breached. It doesn't really matter where that file is. Right. Uh, we have a, a question here from an audience member. Uh, if malware is just sitting in static storage, is it even a threat anyway? Oh, that's a great question. So what, what, you know, what do we mean by, uh, the issues of actually having malware residing in static storage, um, and you know what's, uh, I guess uh, George, maybe let's go over a scenario uh, in which a, a file that you know we did at the time of entry uh, it was flagged as clean, and then we do something with it later on. Um, mm. Yeah, usually um, for an attack to happen, uh, an action is needed, and usually that action is to open the file. Um, that's it probably almost every case um, where, where you have to have someone opening the file for the attack to happen. Um, there are multiple stages attacks where the threat actor would try to split the payload into different stages. Um, and then once it's been delivered um, uh, to the network, all the pieces are put together and, and the attack would carry on. Um, and if we're talking about critical infrastructure, that's uh, mainly to steal data. Uh, that's the main reasoning behind um, the attack. Less so with destructive uh, uh, consequences, right? Mm -hmm. I would say in, in most of the cases, users would have to open the file, right? But they would eventually do that, uh, right? After you, you, it's not like users only use the file the day you transfer it, right? If it's um, let's take an example of a, of a user guide or some sort of document with instructions uh, that's being used in, in critical infrastructure, right? Um, the engineers won't memorize all the instructions, especially if it's a, an equipment that's not used on a daily basis. So if we transfer a PDF document, let's say, that has some sort of, of malicious code uh, inside, they're gonna open that document, that user guide, uh, probably I don't know, every month or so, and you know that that attack will happen at some point. Right, and that could be doing something simple like just taking a snapshot of the screen and sending it off somewhere. Uh, exactly, it can be. Eventually, they might find something, uh, uh, you know, valuable enough to get into a VPN, or you know, any any number of things. Exactly. Yeah, it does. Like I said, it doesn't have to be destructive, right? Is usually threat actors would keep it low profile for a long time during their recon phase uh, until they they understand 
the network architecture and what are the weak points and uh, where's, where's the valuable information. Um, and obviously they want to fly under the radar in that, in that, in that period. And we've seen different studies that show for how long a file can go undetected in a network and it's north of 180 days almost always so right yeah you know, i mean especially if you're talking about critical infrastructure environments as well because when we're when you know you're mentioning somebody using opening a user guide i mean they might be running you know window as windows xp because that's what that uh, you know, Modbus controller system yeah. on that on that human machine interface is using. So, you know, you can't even rely on modern um, local antivirus to catch correct <laughs> really basic malware uh, if they're you know if if they uh, it got somehow got through and it's sitting in storage. Yeah, and I, I've had many discussions with customers in this space where they they know there is something malicious in the network. But they can't do anything about it because if if they delete some of those files, a process is going to to stop, and they just yeah. they just need to control it somehow, right? And the more data they know about that mal malicious activity, the better the better off they are. Right. They just have they have some kind of uh, operation fully isolated, Correct. not 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 propagating to the entire network, but it's still doing the job that they need. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's an that's an unfortunate reality within uh, the uh, a lot of the infrastructure sector that I've also seen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's you know very very interesting. I think uh, as a as a that's a good that's a good um, um, answer to the question. I believe uh, some some use cases as to why um, you know for the user who asked um, even even if the file is sitting there not doing anything, it doesn't mean that down the road, it won't do something catastrophic. So uh, there's there's always that risk, and the this whole concept of ensuring that the data at rest is is still being scanned, it's it's to avoid those kind of scenarios where later down the road, uh, you know, a malicious file, a malicious package isn't opened in a vulnerable or inopportune uh, you know moment as we go through. Correct. Especially when you think about customers that have mandates to store the data for seven years, five years, and so on, and they undergo regular audits where, you know, the auditors might actually have to look through those files um, to, to do their job. Um, so there, I, I, I would say there's plenty of opportunities for those files to be executed at some point during that file life cycle. Um, we should be focusing on how to secure those rather than is there a chance for those to actually uh, uh, detonate and create some some issues in the network. Got it. All right. Thank you. Well, George, I usually like to give um, uh, the guest speaker a little bit of time to talk about the products that are relevant to the conversations that we've had here. I typically save it for five minutes at the end, but since there's there's actually two products, um, that I want to, you know, give a high-level overview here. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, MetaDefender Vault and MetaDefender uh, for secure storage and the, you know, unique approaches and use cases that that's relevant to the uh, concepts we talked about here today. You mind uh, sure. taking the floor with that? I'll gladly do that. So let's right. start with MetaDefender Vault. Essentially, Vault it's an integral part of our cross-domain solution set where we have the kiosk in the DMZ in the perimeter that would scan data from portable media as that data goes into the network. Um, so there's one security control for the data in motion or for, for the data being transferred into the network. And then the vault does the second part, right? It stores the files on the long term. It provides a nice user interface uh, where the file can be retrieved for but most importantly, it can, with a click of a button, implement that continuous free scanning. There's a feature on the vault, we call it uh, outbreak prevention, and it does exactly that. It, it tries to prevent outbreaks uh, by continuously analyzing those files. And we do that by using different technologies. I think it's been mentioned throughout the, uh, uh, the webinar. We do multi-scanning, but we also do uh, next generation sandboxing based on emulation. And we can leverage both those technologies 
in analyzing the data at rest in that uh, usually secure facility, a secure network, right? Um, the, the other benefit of Vault is that it provides full audit trail um, where, where we can get information about the source, um, uh, the, the IP and the user that has downloaded that file that changed status. Uh, so uh, then an incident response can start. The, uh, the incident response team would be able to locate the file immediately in the network by just looking at the Vault logs. That's a really simple and really powerful way of implementing that best practice when it comes to securing data at rest, especially in secure facilities. The other product uh, we've been mentioning so far, it's uh, Meta Defender for Secure Storage. And I think the name is, is gives it away. Um, it, it's, it's essentially connecting to different interfaces to secure uh, data at rest. And that can be an SMB interface for um, on-premise networks. Uh, it can be an SFTP interface. It will very soon be an NFS interface, uh, but it can be um, the native cloud object storage, uh, the likes of Amazon S3 buckets, um, uh, Google object storage, Alibaba object storage, uh, you name it, all the, all the popular ones. What the product does, obviously, it does act on new files being created on that storage that we're monitoring. So first, it does scan and analyze the files as they're being created on the storage. But then, um, again, really simply through, through the user interface, we can implement a scheduler uh, where we choose how often we want to scan the entire data storage uh, for the files that exist at rest and then take actions based on those results. Um, all while providing all the logging necessary to the uh, security operators operation center, uh, so they can they can get that valuable information and do something about that that malware that's being detected. Uh, with your permission, I, I, I'd like to also uh, speak about ICAP because it somehow uh, fits into this picture uh, by by integrating with uh, the likes of Dell Isilon. Um, like Hitachi, Hitachi yeah. Vantara, and so on. You know, so many other um, on-premise storage solutions. Um, you're, you're a sales engineer at heart, George. You just want to keep running with all the products. <laughs> you, you, you got kiosk in there. You might as well uh, also talk about ICAP. So. Yeah, exactly. But it does, it does, it does that, right? It does allow customers to connect to their on-premise storage through a um, an interface, um, a native interface called ICAP and implement that um, continuous scan uh, through, through a scheduler. So there's multiple products at Opsa that would help us define a strategy together with the customers on how that data at rest should be secured. All of them have their pros and cons, all of them fit a specific use case, uh, and it's the sales engineering team that would um, design the solution together with the customers um, on what product is the best for their approach. It can be a combination of multiple products. I've, I've done um, projects where we've uh, used both Vault and MDSS to scan data at rest and transfer it between networks um, where we wanted to have some sort of a nice user interface for uh, regular users to use uh, and we use Vault. And then when we had admins and we just wanted automation, we use MDSS uh, to transfer data between networks or between storage units uh, and, and obviously scan the data regularly. Um, yeah, that's, you know, 10,000 feet over, overview right. of the, the three products that we have that would be able to solve that, those challenges that we've, so the, dis that we've been discussing. The bottom line is that every, every network's different and unique but uh, we make sure that we have the tools to handle data at rest in all its forms. Correct. Yeah, there we go. All right, George, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for those of you that I didn't get to, uh, we didn't get to answer the questions, uh, we'll follow up with you uh, after the call via email. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for participating in another Opsod Academy webinar, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right. Thank you. Thank you, George, again. All right. Goodbye. Thank you, Nate. Bye-bye.